Cool. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining. Uh, I'm going to be talking a little bit about DFIQ or codifying digital forensics intelligence. And if that sounds a little opaque or you have no idea what it means, then that's good because you're stuck with me for the next 30 minutes uh, while I explain this. So back in January, I was uh, giving a course to some 20 year olds with Sebastian here. Um, and I was like, okay, how do I explain forensics to people who've never done forensics before and who probably, you know, are just starting to get into the professional uh, realm of, of incident response and, and stuff like that? So I tried breaking it down to this, uh, to this one question, which is like, forensics is actually answering a question by uncovering digital traces and interpreting them in a reproducible way. I think this is more or less, we can agree that this is what forensics is, uh, but you can break it down into four main, um, main points. So first of all, you have like answering a question. There's no point in doing forensics unless you have a question you want to get answered, right? Uh, then you have to collect digital traces. Uh, we also call it evidence or we call it artifacts. And then the analyst has to interpret this evidence that they collected, right? And, you know, ideally, if you collect one piece of evidence to answer one specific question, then you will always interpret it in the same way. Uh, so the, ideally, your interpretation is reproducible and you can do it as the same way every time. So questions can be very high level, like what happened on this computer. Uh, we all love getting a forensics case where they ask us, please tell us if this computer is infected. It's very hard to prove a negative. But there are things you can do to make it your life a little less painful, like breaking it down into lower level questions, like how did this malware persist on the system? Um, are we seeing any, any type of like odd files on the file system and so on? A digital trace can be anything uh, from a browsing history file or an event log, like, oh, this event 4624 from this IP address was found in this event log. And then the interpretation of this event would be like, okay, the attacker logged onto the system. But this also depends on the IP address that they're logging in from, right? And so a very common question that we get um, from newcomers uh, or even in my team when, when I'm working with my peers is I, I find this, this cool stuff that I found, right? And they're like, how did you find this? And so I'm like, oh, it's very simple. I just ran the DF time with recipe, manually specifying event logs in GUR and a quick Turbinia setting. And I ran this cool query on time sketch. This makes no sense to you, maybe, unless you're using our whole, our whole open source stack. Uh, it does make sense to more experienced people in my team. Uh, but, you know, newbies are going to be like, oh, yeah, some of these words I sort of get, but like, can you show me what query you use? Because, okay. And then the guy shows this, right? It's like, okay. Who, who here has like that kind of file on their desktop hanging around? Okay. I see a few hands. That's fair. I also have it. Um, I have a full list of SQL queries that I run for specific things, but there's a couple of problems here, right? Uh, first of all, you have to know what question to ask. Uh, this is a very common caveat in, um, in newcomers to the field. They're like, okay, I have this system. I know all these artifacts that I can collect, but I have no idea how to articulate my investigation. Um, also knowing where to find digital traces. We've seen at least two very good talks uh, today and yesterday about like, Linux persistence mechanisms, Windows persistence mechanisms, and so on. Um, it gets very hard to keep up with OS development, uh, new things that they're doing, things that they're removing, and so on. So it's always very difficult to keep track of this. Um, knowing how to interpret findings also is very useful, uh, and I would say critical to uh, doing forensic investigations, because in some cases you might be you know, indicting uh, foreign hackers or uh, sending people to jail so you want to interpret things correctly. And ideally, as I said, consistently as well. Um, it would be terrible if you go up to a judge and be like, yeah, look, I have all this evidence that I analyzed um, and I reached this conclusion and the judge is like, yeah, well, someone did this yes and same thing two years ago in this other case and they found the opposite. So now you're done. So anyways, who am I? I'm Tom. Uh, I do digital forensics and, invest and instant response at Google. Uh, I'm the Yeti creator and core developer. Uh, I spoke about this last year. We'll be pitching in a little more, but today I'm not here to talk about Yeti. A little bit I am, but mostly about DFIQ, and I'm going to evangelize everyone here. So we're going to talk a little bit about what DFIQ is, because I've mentioned it before, but you have no idea what it is yet. In theory, also in practice, and we're going to see like a little bit of the open source implementations challenges that we had that also might be hateful for everyone who is you know, attempting to do something like this. One note on pronunciation, uh, I pronounce this DFIQ. If you try to pronounce it, 
as a word, you will get very interesting results. So what's the FIQ? It stands for Digital Forensics Investigative Questions. And it's essentially a catalog of questions uh, that you might want to ask in a forensics investigation and also how to answer them. So the latter part is also very interesting and important. The goal is to make investigations consistent and also explainable. How did you find this? Well, here's exactly the thing that I used to find it. It's also aimed to lower the barrier of entry to forensics. New people who come, they want to see like, okay, how do we know, how do we as a team know how to find persistence on a disk? Here's a list of things you can look for. We as a team, my team is distributed in at least three different sites so far. We might be opening three more sites in the near future. So, you know, where the knowledge is going to be distributed and it's important that every site does the analysis in a similar way um, because, you know, you want to be consistent with your analysis. And one of the things that DFIQ is, is it's YAML based. Um, and so the idea is that DFIQ can be system agnostic. Um, it's, it doesn't rely on any backend or database so it can be useful, so you can just use it as it is. It's essentially a bunch of YAML files held together by a GitHub repo. You'll see more on that later. DFAQ objects are composed in scenarios, facets, questions, and approaches. We're going to be very more, mostly interested in the questions and approaches because this is what I've been talking about so far. Um, but questions are grouped into facets. Facets are essentially a group of questions like, okay, show me all the questions that can answer things about persistence or, you know, process injection or so on. Facets are grouped into scenarios. You can also attach questions to scenarios directly. And a scenario would be something like, okay, a host compromise. What are the questions you can ask about a host compromise? What facets of the investigation can you tackle here? Um, what is a good question? Because there's a lot of questions that you can ask during forensics investigations, but a good question has to be generic enough to be reusable. You want to be able to attach it to different scenarios, maybe different facets. So was blah.exe downloaded by Chrome? That's not a super good question because it's very specific to the incident that you're working on where the malware is called blah.exe. And it has to be specific enough as well to be relevant. So if you want to be like, oh, what are the files that were written to disk? Then you'll get basically a file system listing. Maybe it's interesting, but mostly you may want to narrow it down a little more. Um, and ideally your question, you can also have an empty question that doesn't have any documented approach but then the usefulness is not that good, right? So let's assume this question. What files were downloaded using a web browser? It's a pretty good question. And there's many ways to, to tackle this, right? And these are three approaches that I picked kind of at random. Uh, you could examine file systems events in home downloads. You can examine on-host browsing history files. So this would be like the Chrome uh, or the Firefox or Safari uh, SQL-like databases that do this. Um, or you could also, if you have like an EDR or something, you could examine file writes uh, that are coming from any browsing process and then this would give you an idea of how to do this. So you'll notice that all these approaches are a little bit different and they don't all cover exactly the same things. Uh, you could also imagine, um, you could have, if you have a reverse proxy or something set up in your company, you could also imagine uh, reading proxy logs, but then things that will get covered will vary. So it's important to have a list of approaches that cover most of your use cases that you find. So concretely, this is what a question looked like. It's a quite ugly YAML file. Um, let me see if I can put the mouse here. Um, you have the name of the question, the type of the DFAQ object, that's the question, the UID, the ID that we are going to talk a little more about later, uh, the DFAQ version to keep track of what schema uh, shape it has, and then you have parent IDs which are like the, the facets or the scenarios that these are attached to. And this is where uh, DFIQ is really system agnostic. So you can just set this up in, the, in your text file, in your YAML file, and all will be good. Uh, the interesting part is the approaches here, where you can see like sort of a copy and paste of, of what I mentioned before. And if we zoom in a little bit, we see the approaches. If you expand them, you'll get a name, description, tags, some references. So if you need more information on this, some notes, if we zoom in on the notes, you'll see exactly what's covered by the approach, what's not covered by the approach. Uh, so that can be very useful for people who are like uh, starting here. Um, and the approach has steps. And in this case, the steps are collect forensic uh, artifact data, process the data with Plazo or log to timeline, which is like a forensic sparser tool, uh, and then filter the results, the results to just file downloads in your analysis tool. And this is what a step looks like. So there's a name, there's a description, there's a stage, which is a little bit important because we'll, we'll, we'll get to it later, and then there's a type. In this case, forensic artifacts 
is a type that we selected just to say, okay, this is a forensic artifact that you're going to be looking for. And in this very specific context, forensic artifacts are another open source project that we maintain, uh, which is sort of a knowledge base of where to find different types of digital uh, evidence information. Um, it's used by GER. Uh, I also think it's used by Velociraptor. Um, and it's, it can be used by any other uh, tool that you want because it's also open source and it's also YAML. Uh, so it's very descriptive. And value in this case is the, the actual forensic artifact that we want to get. Then processing the data with Plazo. This can also be a, a type command step. So it just says like, okay, process this with Plazo. And if you notice here, there's like a path to evidence variable, which will break your shell if you try to copy and paste this, but it's meant for humans or machines to be able to replace this with uh, the actual path of the artifacts that you downloaded. And finally, the analysis. In our case, we upload everything to TimeSketch, which is yet another open source tool that we have, which allows us to uh, process Plasma files and show us a forensic timeline of, of our systems. And if you run this query, then you'll see that you'll only get like all the downloaded files by browsers, not even like the website visits, only the downloaded files. Um, scenarios are much simpler. Uh, they're essentially the top level uh, attributes of the question that I showed, and facets are essentially the same. So now, I've explained all this, it's really dense, but how, how do you use this uh, concretely? So not all approaches will be relevant to all environments. I mentioned before reverse proxies. Uh, I know it's a very common thing to have in an enterprise setting, but we, for example, do not have any reverse proxies. So if you come up with an approach uh, to a web browsing investigation and you see like with, with a reverse proxy, then it will not be useful for everyone else. Uh, it will be useful to you though. But you can take into account all your custom uh, workflows, all your proprietary systems. If you use Splunk, if you use CrowdStrike, whatever it is that you use, you can easily document this because it's not a prescriptive format. Um, you have internal versus public approaches. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more on that later as well. Um, it's essentially a flag that you can set or a tag that you can add to your approaches to designate whether they're public or, or private. Uh, and again, as I said, like the YAML schema is system agnostic, so you can just use it. Um, our website, dfiq.org, um, uses actually the YAML files that have been uploaded to the GitHub repo to generate this sort of wiki that you can find on the website. So you could very, very simply clone the repo, add your YAML files, run the code generation website, and then you have a wiki instantly with all your forensics uh, methodology encoded in there. Um, this is a shameless um, s s uh, theft of another presentation that we had uh, yesterday, I think it was, from Stefan Berger, um, where he talked a little bit about like all the LD preload things. This is typically the kind of stuff that would be great to encode in DFIQ. So if you're working on a Linux persistence uh, scenario or Linux compromise scenario, then you can easily reference this and have it checked, uh, maybe even automatically. Again, Stefan, we need to talk later. <laughs> Uh, also a good list of stuff to find uh, bad or shady executables in. You could even create a forensic artifact definition of this and use it, or you could just use this list in DFIQ if this is what you wanted. Uh, but this is typically exactly the type of information that is very hard to remember. It's very specific, uh, but it can yield very cool results uh, if you use it consistently. So how do we use it? Um, we use it with Yeti. Yeti, I presented, I, I gave a talk about Yeti last year, which started by being a CTI platform, but we moved it to be more like a forensics intelligence platform. So in our case, practically, it stands as the backend for DFIQ, and it is what serves DFIQ objects to all our other tools in the pipeline. So there's question approaches. I, I don't know how well you can see this here, um, but essentially it does the same function that the blog uh, that we have on DFIQ.org would do. It just parses the YAML and renders it in a nice, friendly way. Uh, we have a DFIQ tree where you can really see easily from a question, you can see all the approaches, and from all the approaches, you can see all the steps that happen. So it's very good to be able to document things. Um, and if you want to see at a glance what your things are doing, uh, what, your, what your definitions are, you can do it. And finally, no one wants to write YAML, right? YAML is like the younger brother, the younger, cooler brother of XML, but still doesn't, not super pleasant to write. Um, so we came up with a UI that allows you to add remove objects and still have a consistent 
properly formatted YAML file. Um, this is an example of how you could add a step that we've seen before uh, to, to the approach. And we also have a very cool graph um, of, of our things. If I can zoom in, maybe. Yeah, there we go. So you can see this is the, exactly the, the kind of suspicious DNS query, which is our scenario, uh, what application was responsible for the DNS query, and then what process made the DNS query. This is what a DFIQ scenario looks like um, in the database. Regarding automation, um, what, Yeti, what, what we have going on is uh, we use DF Time Wolf for automation. DF Time Wolf is a tool that we also uh, wrote as part of our open source uh, stack, which is going to read a scenario uh, from Yeti, then it's going to unroll the DFIQ graph. So it's going to take all the facets, all the questions, all the approaches, and it's going to select the ones that we have so far. It's still at a proof of concept stage, but we have a particular focus on collection, um, analysis, type steps. Collection will be maybe any kind of log that we can find or any kind of GUR forensic artifact that we want to query the, the fleet for. Uh, and analysis type steps is going to be all the queries that we want to uh, add to time sketch uh, and so on. So the idea is have DF Time Wolf collect all this information, launch all the GUR flows, wait for them to be processed, and then send everything to time sketch, and then on the time sketch side, apply all the analysis things. And you could have it uh, add safe searches to time sketch, for example, which is a, a functionality that exists, or you could have it query time sketch with the queries that you just saw, and then report this somewhere else. Uh, it could be in your ticketing system, it could be as a file on disk, and so on. Um, so yeah, this, this has been pretty, pretty interesting so far to experiment with, uh, but you know, LLMs are the new hotness, so this presentation will probably not be complete without at least one attempt at an LLM thing. So let me see if I can play this video for you. The idea here is to have a script that only queries uh, Yeti and time sketch. And what you'll see here is um, this script querying Yeti, doing a very similar thing where it develops all the graph, but in this case it's just going to keep the queries. From the queries, it is going to launch a query on time sketch. It is going to get the results from time sketch back into its code. Uh, and it is going to use a prompt that should be popping up anytime now. Yeah. For each question, there's a prompt. The prompt is like, you're this mega ninja security analyst. Here's a bunch of logs. Please make sense of it. Um, so this is going to get processed uh, by the, by the LLM engine. And if we skip forward a little bit, uh, we collect all these results into an array of sorts and then we concatenate them and feed everything back once again to the LLM and we ask the LLM like, hey, from all this information, what can you tell us uh, that happened on this disk? Um, and so the end result to this is maybe not the most accurate description of what happened, but this is uh, a proof of concept that we had on a, a disk that was compromised by a crypto miner uh, because it got its way into SSH due to a weak password uh, and a root user. And so what you see here is the LLM actually telling you like, yeah, well, this looks like XM rig. Uh, this is the IP that compromised it. Um, you, this is where the XM rig binary lives. It's under root and so on and so on. So one of the big challenges that we have as forensic analysts often is we don't have uh, an anchor point to start an investigation with or the anchor point is a little vague, like for example, a timestamp where suspicious activity was detected. Having an analyst uh, getting pinged because a ticket was escalated to them, and then when they get on the ticket, they already have all the evidence that they need, plus a summary that is, yes, machine generated, but maybe it's accurate, uh, is already a huge lead um, to have on, uh, on this. Doing this was not without challenges. Um, we tried, we tried, we were working on this design for like two years before we started uh, actually using it for ourselves. Uh, we, we did tackle some of them. The first one was the initial version of the schema was extremely hard to understand, especially for people who had not designed or were not involved in the creation of the schema. No one wanted to write YAML, uh, especially not with such a complicated schema. You know, you're one tab away of messing everything up, so that's really bad. The contribution process was also very unclear. 
Um, should I start with public or private uh, objects? What happens when I have to switch IDs? And switching IDs, I mean this because in the first version of DFIQ, we had encoded the public private bits into the ID of the object. And you might think that's fine, but then if you want to start creating a new object that's internal or not, not public, it will start with a zero, right? So then when you submit your pull request to the repo, you want to change it to a one. But what if someone else already has a same ID with a one? You need some kind of identity federation, right? We'll talk more about this in the next slide, but the approaches were also separate from the questions and they were associated to the question on a one-to-one -one basis. So in this case, Q1001 means this is a public question and dot one zero means it's a public approach. But if you want to have private approaches to public questions or, you know, you could essentially have also public approaches to private questions, which just doesn't make sense. Um, so we moved away from this and now we're using, we're leveraging the tags that you can use in DFIQ to denote whether, uh, whether an object is private or public. And yeah, the initial implementation of this was quite tricky. So I mentioned a little bit about doing pull requests and you know attributing and assigning IDs. Um, this was an initial will of us to be like a federation of DFIQ objects across uh, the, the community. A little bit like what MITRE ATT&CK is to sticks. Um, DFIQ would be sticks and this federation would be like MITRE ATT&CK or this collection or this repo would be like MITRE ATT&CK. Um, but did we though? That was that was not a good idea because we, we we did not have the resources or the the time actually to um, take into account like a system where you can submit IDs and you can hand, you get handed out an ID, and also you could not create a DFIQ object that did not have one of those IDs. So you had to come up with an ID, a random one, and then cross your fingers and pray to God that this ID had not already been taken. But that was solved with the uh, with the new UID schema. We still have a couple of challenges ahead of us. Um, data curation, so the having a web interface to write very easily write DFIQ objects is great, but that means that a lot of people in the team are using it. And while I was writing these slides, I wanted to look for examples of this um, login event in security VTX, and I saw like four different questions that were essentially the same. So this was the bullet point here. I do think that data curation and avoiding duplicate questions is going to be a challenge in the future. Um, I still don't know how, how we can address this except by asking people to be diligent, which, you know, if they did, we would not have a job. So another point that I wanted to highlight is we are trying to make forensics investigations very linear and very reproducible, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of hand-holding involved and like, okay, you have this problem, this is the query that you have to use, this is how you have to interpret data. But we all know that a lot of investigations are not that structured and very often we start by doing, we have experience and we use that experience to like, oh, maybe I have a hunch, maybe if I run this query I'll find something interesting. Um, and it's like this creativity and in the end you end up with completely insane queries that just happen to highlight exactly what's bad and explaining how you got there is really, really hard. And a lot of people will be like, I would never have thought of this. But also it's not something that is really worth documenting all the time. I mean, it is worth documenting it in your incident report or in your forensics report, but is it really worth polluting all the database with these very, very specific approaches to solving problems? I don't know. And we also want to leave people with this, you know, creativity or this open source or open-minded way of tackling problems. So we don't want to be too prescriptive and we also don't want people to do whatever. Uh, and another problem is like, okay, how we can, how could we convince the team to contribute? Uh, there's like 30 or 35 of us distributed globally across, across the world. Um, it's, it's not going to be possible to have everyone contribute in the way that we would like to. Uh, we have a very good culture of code review uh, at Google, so that might be an avenue. Uh, but also, what's really important is to get people motivated to contribute to this and be like, seeing the value in the more time I spend working on this DFIQ question, then the better it will be for everyone, including myself, in the future. So that's a little bit of a challenge. What's even more of a challenge is how do we convince the public, so everyone here, 
to also be like, oh, how do I convince you know Stefan to be like, ah, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna translate my slides into the FIQ objects and contribute. I don't I don't have the answer to this. If you have ideas, you can hit me up uh, during the break, uh, and we can talk more about it. The main takeaways of this talk, and thanks for bearing with me so far, is DFIQ, cool stuff, catalog, forensic questions, and approaches to answering them. If you are lacking a wiki, uh, this could be a solution. Uh, it is aimed to increase investigation consistency, onboarding speed, and knowledge sharing across your team. It has a more simple schema than it used to have, uh, and that's very good for powerful automation avenues, uh, systems can really easily read YAML and they can operate on it. It's open source, you can just grab it, anyone can contribute, and I've left two links here uh, for you to take a little picture of. DFIQ.org, very easy to remember, and Yeti Dash Platform, which is the system that we use as a backend. That's it, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Thanks. Uh, first, thanks for the presentation. I think that the uh, standardized playbooks really helps our teams, CTI and forensic teams, to uh, really mature the process. Um, I think you should take inspiration uh, about the, the sharing of the rules and the playbooks from the MISP community that manage uh, many taxonomies and galaxies, and they have a really nice dynamic on how to have everyone contribute, and they might have solved some of your problems with for example, unique, identif unique identifier. Uh, one question is, how would you compare um, your tools with uh, Open Relic? Which, which one, sorry? Open Relic. Open Relic? Yeah. Open Relic happens to be a tool developed by the same person who started working on TimeSketch. Um, so we're in close contact with them. Uh, <laughs> But yes, Open Relic in this case um, would be more of a pipeline tool and uh, a processing tool where you can like send evidence. It will, you know, go through a bunch of processing and analysis steps, and it will output results to Time Sketch. So it is exactly um, it would fit exactly well in the processing step of one of the DFIQ approaches that you would have. It would be like send this to Open Relic and let it do its magic. Okay, so you would see that as a combination of the Yeti platform and uh, the, uh, the general approach. Yeah, absolutely. Yeti would just be there to uh, deliver the recipes or the routines to the tools, and then the tools would take care of hitting the APIs that are right. Anyone else? No, I don't see anything. Thanks a lot, cool. Thomas. Thank you.